Tape with Scott. I'm the host, Scott Cunningham, professor of economics at Baylor University. This is a show devoted to the stories of living economists, though sometimes uh, it includes non-economists, and today is one of those days. Today we are interviewing uh, assistant professor in the Department of Statistics at the University of Washington, Carlos Zanelli. Uh, Carlos Zanelli did his PhD in stats at UCLA, and he was advised by Uta Pearl. Uh, he also was advised uh, sort of informally by uh, Ed Lemer in the econ department. Um, I wanted to talk to Carlos because he's done some really interesting work on sensitivity analysis and uh, omitted variable bias that I thought was interesting to economists. But I, I also wanted to talk to him because he's sort of someone that I think uh, some people might identify with his story a little bit. Carlos actually did his undergraduate in economics and then his master's in economics. So he was actually uh, on the track to doing a doctorate and he was actually very, very interested in econometrics. That's why he ended up in statistics. And I thought it would be just kind of worth sort of stepping back and remembering that, you know, there are many, there, there's, there's a lot of things that go into being an economist that over time there are, there are Venn diagrams where those things that make you love economics uh, there's other things out there for you too. And I thought talking with Carlos to sort of see about these different paths, about how he left economics, but stayed in causal inference uh, would be kind of exciting. Thanks so much for tuning in. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, follow all the things. I forget all the things. I uh, hope you have a great day. I hope you enjoy this interview with Carlos. See you later. Okay. So this is a really cool opportunity. I've met uh, well, this is someone I haven't, uh, seen in a long time, I guess about five years, uh, for the sake of the listener, can you tell us your name, your job title and who pays your paycheck? Uh, hi, well, thank you, Scott, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I'm Carlos Sinelli. I'm an assistant professor of statistics at, uh, the university of Washington. Oh, okay. How long <laughs> have you been there? Uh, it has been two years now. I'm entering my third year. Oh, okay. Good. All right. All right. Well, let's go ahead. We're going to start with an icebreaker. Uh, what's a vacation that you had as a kid that to this day you still think about from time to time? As a kid? Uh, um, well, so I used to live in the north of Brazil. Uh, so my dad used to work in, in a mining company. And we used to do these road trips from where the rest of my family is in the southeast. Uh, so it was like three days driving, stopping in every state of Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was kind of fun. Like you get to know the country and like all the different states and uh, kinds of nature that we have here. Uh, and, the, and and later I realized that was unusual. Not a lot of people drive all around Brazil like like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that was great. Um, is it really beautiful yeah, yeah. driving driving through that part of Brazil? In the the nature is back back then the roads were not. No, uh, but now it it has improved a lot. Uh, yeah. But uh, yes, because we we actually do have a wild var variety of of uh, nature. Like it's not all the same. Uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Do you get to go so, back so home a lot? Uh, well, uh, we had COVID for a while, oh, yeah. so that, that kind of messed up a little bit uh, yeah. schedule. But uh, now I'm trying to get back at least once a year um, to, to the holidays, at least. Right? Got it. Got it. Yeah. Well, cool. All right. So you grew up where in Brazil did you grow up? Well, that's a tricky question. So I grew up uh, in, in early childhood in this mining company city uh, in the north of Brazil. So so I think the largest iron ore uh, mines are there in the world, actually. Uh, <clears throat> and then that's where I grew up. It's like a, a small town, uh, mostly for, for people that are working for, for this, uh, this company. Uh, then I moved uh, to the southeast of Brazil, uh, uh, to Vitoria, which is a city close to Rio, Rio de Janeiro. Mm. And I then later, yeah, then later I moved to Brasilia, which is the capital of, of Brazil. Okay. Okay, cool. So you live, so you, uh, when did you move there? When did you move to the capital? 
No, that was a little later in my life. So I moved oh, there, uh, to, yeah, to do my master's in, in economics. Oh, oh his master's. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay, and what did yeah. you say? Your dad worked for a mining company? What did he do for the mining company? He was an engineer. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, for the mining company, yes. Oh, okay. What did your mom do? Uh, uh, she she used to be a, a she's an educator and she used to be a school principal actually. <laughs> oh okay okay. Did you go to her school? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, what kind of games and stuff did you like doing as a kid? What kind of what games? Games. Uh, well, I used to play soccer like um, most Brazilian kids. Uh, we have all this other game that I actually don't even know how to call it, where you have kind of like baseball bats and you have some things that you have to throw a ball and try to to uh, top it over uh, with the ball. And then you, you have the baseball to... Is it like cricket? You, you need to... It's kind of... Yeah, I, I don't know the name, to be honest. It's called bats. Uh, oh, but, were you a pretty good yeah. athlete? Were you good at soccer? Yeah, well, I was I was average. I guess outside of Brazil, I'm good, but uh, in Brazil, I was average. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. The, right, right. The level here is a little higher. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah sure, sure. <laughs> and so, if so, if 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 they had asked you when you were ten years old, you go back to when you were ten, and they said, "Carlos, what do you want to be when you grow up? What What do you think you would have said?" Oh. I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, yeah, that's a tough question. For sure, I wouldn't have said uh, an economist or a statistician. That that was something that grew up later in my life. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, maybe an astronaut or physicist. I, I actually liked physics a lot when I was a kid. Yeah, I was like, oh, very okay. curious about physics. Yeah. Sure. Sure. You get that engineering. <clears throat> dad, you have that engineering dad. So like science is kind of in the family a little bit. Yeah, a little, a little bit. Yeah. So I guess my, my family side is more of the entrepreneur side, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but there is a little bit of a science side as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So tell me about high school. How big was your high school and what town was it in again? Uh, so the high school actually, no, I actually, no, uh, I skipped one place that I lived. I also lived in another city, uh, <laughs> Yeah, because of this job, uh, we, we used to move a lot. So my high school uh, was half of it in a city in the northeast of Brazil. Um, and it was a big high school. Uh, and then later, I actually did an exchange student program uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I spent one year there. And then I guess uh, I own a lot of my English fluency to, to what my... What year was that? How old this, were you then? How old were you in Nashville? It, it, well, it was in the senior year. Uh, I oh. guess, how old are we? Six, 17? I don't remember. Uh, uh, yeah, so it was in oh. the senior year of, of, of the of high school senior year. Yeah. Was that common amongst your friends to do that kind of exchange exchange thing? I'm not sure if it was uh, very common, no. Yeah, but like since my mom had done it. Um, oh, then and then uh, she thought it was a nice experience, and then yeah. I guess that's why uh, we decided to do it too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm from Tennessee. Uh, I, I I I lived yeah. in Memphis, and uh, and then I went to school at UT Knoxville. Did you like Nashville? Yeah, I did enjoy it. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was fun. Yeah, I yeah. liked it a lot actually. <laughs> that's awesome. Cool. Well, so if they so tell me what your so you spent some of it in in nashville and then you spent some of it in brazil right like you spent a few years yes. in brazil okay so what was it like what was what was your overall experience like for <laughs> high school well i guess uh so there, there were some not notable noticeable differences in the high school so for example in brazil uh the technical side is actually i think stronger the average technical side in the high school but in the U.S., you have a lot more freedom. Like, you can really make your own curriculum. Uh, so that was interesting to see. So if you really want to go further in something, like, for example, uh, in mathematics, uh, I think the uh, you can, there is, a, like, a, a 
you can either do a lot of advanced mathematics in the high school if it offers the AP classes. Yeah. Uh, or you can just do the bare minimum. And then that's like very, very low compared to, for example, I guess the, the minimum you have to do in Brazil. Oh, the minimum in Brazil uh, is actually pretty high. It's higher, not not very high. It's higher, but it's higher than the minimum uh, in the U.S. But the maximum in the U.S. is is higher than the maximum you can do oh. in the standard school in Brazil. Got it. Got it. Got it. Uh, so and, which and did you do? All the, you did the math. Yeah, I did. You did the big. You did the big math, or you did the little math? No, I did. Yeah, I did AP calculus. Uh, oh, okay. So you I did that here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that that was. Uh, Cool, I think. Um, then I did English, music, did, did some other different stuff too. Okay, okay. So, so if yeah. teachers, if teachers had seen you in Brazil, or they did see you, and they said, uh, you know, uh, this is the kind of student Carlos is, what would they have said? How would they have described you? I was a little mischievous as a student. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I found school a little boring. Uh, so, yeah, so I don't know. I'm not sure if I should say this publicly, but yeah. <laughs> you see, the, so, the statute, <laughs> of limit, statute of limitations. So, so they would say, like, yeah, this, yeah, it's like this, this is a smart student, but like, uh, I wish he was a little quieter, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, so when you were 17 and you're graduating, did you have to? Some of these schools outside of the United States, you have to like already know, you have to decide what you're going to major in and, you know, what your whole life is going to be like. Did you have to do that in Brazil? You have to decide your whole, you know, curriculum? Yeah, no. Uh, well, so here, so when you apply to, I think it's a little similar to the U.S., then you apply to, to undergrad uh, and then you pick a, a, a major, right, uh, when you apply to it. Yeah. Uh, so I actually first started uh, doing languages mm. uh, and, and literature, and then and then later I stumbled upon a book from David Ricardo, and then I started reading it, and I didn't understand anything, and I felt very uncomfortable about that. I was like, "How the hell can't I understand this?" Mm. It's like it sounds like it's uh, and, and and then first then I decided to apply for economics. That, that was literally one of the reasons. Because you had change, trouble. Change. What was the book? Do you remember? I don't remember. Principles exactly. of political <clears throat> economy or something like that. Yeah, I should I should recover it. Uh, uh huh. But uh, but I always had like a, I don't know I, I like had a kind of like an economist trade off way of thinking and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. So I was a little already leaning towards it. Mm. Uh, so that, that's when I changed. Uh, well, I actually did both, but, but I also uh, started doing economics. And, and I really liked economics a lot. Um, and, and, and then uh, I basically switched uh, my interests mostly to, to economics. Okay. So, you, so name, the name of your college, what was it? It's uh, so the state schools are very strong, like the federal schools, uh, very strong in Brazil uh, and very common. So it was the Federal University of my state, uh, oh. which back then was uh, Espírito Santo. OK, OK. So you go in yeah. from the beginning, you're going to take economics. And part of it was this experience with being frustrated with this David Ricardo book. If you hadn't have done econ, what would you have done? Well, I was, I was doing literature in, yeah. in, in English, English and, and Portuguese. So I don't know, I guess maybe I would have continued on that. Oh, okay. It's, okay. It's, it's hard to say. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> okay. So what do you think about economics when you were in college? Did you like it? I liked it a lot. Yeah. Uh, so my, so in Brazil, uh, a lot of schools are Marxist. So yeah. my, a lot of my formation was what people would say, well, in the U.S., I guess, uh, I'm not sure how the nomenclature is, but people would call this political economy mm -hmm. uh, instead of economics. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, but there was also the traditional stuff as well. Uh, but when I was like halfway through and I, I wanted to do a master's, I realized, okay, no, actually, there is a pretty large gap between what I'm studying here and the like mainstream stuff uh, that I want to do if I want to pursue a master's. So then I started to study on my own, like, uh, 
more standard uh, micro and and, mm. and and macro economics uh, yeah. and econometrics. Uh, yeah, but it, yeah, I guess what's good to see also and to learn uh, this more heterodox uh, yeah. approach to economics. Do you have a negative reaction to uh, it or were you sort of open-minded? No, I, no. I, uh, well, like uh, I actually enjoyed it a lot. Like when I was first st studying uh, uh, the capital and, and Marxism, yeah. but then uh, you you start finding some like uh, gaps and and, and stumbling blocks. And what I found out was that a lot of the professors didn't want to pursue it further. Right, like when you started criticizing the theory and saying, "Hey," and and I'm saying not criticizing from like a political point of view, more like. Well, I guess there is like a theoretical gap here. What did people do to no. <clears throat> to solve it? Right. Uh, and and they would push back a little bit, saying, you know, but the the poly, like the praxis, I don't know if that's a word in English, is more important than the theory, like the practice oh. is more important. And and then the, that was starting to put me off a little bit. Like uh, well, how'd that make so you feel? Get... You found would you what was that like? Yeah, yeah, I was starting to feel yeah, this is not science, right? Like, uh, mm. because like if, if I don't know, uh, more like uh, it's like we want to know the truth, right? And I want to know like, can I fix the theory, or like, right. is, can, can the theory predict what like real world things, right? Like, yeah, uh, yeah, but it was cool. Like, uh, I, I liked it. I liked my undergrad. Uh, well, uh, so despite. Did Despite you take his, uh, limitations? Did you take any stats classes when you were in college? It, yeah, the, <laughs> I did. Uh, so I, I took actually a stats class, which was horrible uh, because it was like those cookbook stats uh -huh. kind of class. Uh, basically, like teaching t tests and how to do significant tests, and I was like, man, this is like, is this what a stats is? Like, this is like, I don't know. There's no like foundation or anything, but that was just mm. the way it was taught. Uh, then when I took econometrics, that's uh, F because we first took the stats class and then like we had the econometric sequence. That's when I I, I started to get excited about it. And by the way, with uh, using the Jeff's book. <laughs> You're using Wooldridge? Uh, yeah, Wooldridge, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I what do you like about edition, it? It's probably one of the earliest editions. One yeah. of the earlier editions. Yeah. What would you like about yeah. Wooldridge so much? Or what do you like about econometrics? I, I it, it's like just the idea that we could use uh data and models to answer all these like important policy questions. You were interested uh, in policy. In examples. Yeah, and policy and learning how the world works. Like, can we tweak something to change something else? Uh, was this the cause of that? So, and then that's like where causality started to sneak in as well. You heard if causality. You, know you were thinking about causality in those econometrics classes. You were thinking about that. Yes, but like in the way that uh, that later I realized it was insufficient, right? So like we were thinking about causality, but without the proper language back then, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, right. but of course, all the questions we were trying to answer, Satoris Paribus stuff, right? Uh, that, that was all like causally loaded words. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, but then later there was another like uh, thing that uh, in my mind was, wait, we're, we're using all this language, this is this, uh, but we don't have, like we're not expressing the assumptions correctly. So what's going on here? And that was something that was bothering me that later I resolved, I guess, uh, in, only in the PhD, in the master's and then in PhD. But, um, but yeah, so that, that was like, I guess, when I really started to get excited about like statistics uh, and, and methods more, uh, was taking in econometric classes. But then you go, did, go did, did really my, micro. Micro was also very fun, I thought. Mm. Macroeconomics, yeah. But so you end up doing this, you end up doing a graduate degree in economics, right? Uh, then later I did a master's in economics, yes. Master's so in economics. University, yeah, in University of Brasilia. So that's uh, in, an, uh, in the capital. So were so you thinking at that time in college, you wanted to get a PhD in economics? Uh, yes. When I started the master's, yes. Uh, uh, but first... But first, I, so I, I uh, after, uh, after the masters, I joined the Central Bank of Brazil, mm. 
uh, and then during the central bank, I said, okay, now uh, like I want to go back and do a PhD, but but later uh, my interests start to evolve a little bit, and that's where I started thinking, uh, maybe I should do a PhD in statistics. How did that happen? What ha is that? That's something that's happening at the bank. During the masters and at the bank together. So oh. in the masters, uh, I started to to grow more methodological interests. Yeah. About like uh, uh, the nature of statistical questions, significance testing, causality, um, mm. and, and like uh, and things like that. Like how how can we do empirical work that actually answers what we want to answer, and how to how we formalize those things. And then at the bank, uh, <clears throat> I started get like heavily involved with uh, programming and other types of statistical models. And then when I was thinking about doing a PhD, I said, well, actually, uh, maybe if I do a PhD in statistics, I'm not going to be married to a specific uh, substantive field of study. So, so like, oh, uh, I got would be it. free to, I would be free to. To as a work on causality, but not not just causality. Thinking about my audience, my audience, my sorry, my audience is only economists, and uh, you can talk to other audiences as well, right? <clears throat> so, were you so interested we in causal? Freedom. You were interested in causal inference first, or statistics first? That's a good question. In statistics first, because I didn't know. Like uh, I, I, I learned about. So the first contact with, uh, let's say, of course, in econometrics we had causal inference, but I think uh, the old the old econometrics textbooks, uh, there is this conflation, like of like it's not clear what is causal, what is not causal, right? Like we have the linear model, and then we interpret the coefficients, and and and, and now this is of course has changed a lot, but in the old days. Uh, People were very confused about what types of assumptions would go uh, into, into the models. Uh, yeah. And so, I, so I was more interested in statistics, uh, but during my master's, uh, one of my uh, dissertation, uh, because the master's in Brazil is very similar actually to a PhD. Oh. Uh, uh, so so you, you take the PhD, the same classes as the PhD, and, and you write a thesis as well. And the thesis, uh, it doesn't need to be like a PhD thesis, but it would be like one paper or yeah. like one chapter of a PhD thesis, right? Right. So it's like one paper. Right. And then one of my, uh, the, the, the committee members, <clears throat> uh, he started to get interested in causality and, and he'll say like, oh, Carlos, you're interested in all this methodological stuff. Maybe you should read this book. Uh, and then he gave me causality by Pearl. He did. Who said this? This is one of your yeah. colleagues? In the master's No, program? that was one of the... Yeah, one of the committee members of oh. my master's. Uh, <clears throat> what year was this? Uh, now you're going to... Because it's the second it edition is 09, right? In the second edition, 2009? <laughs> yes. Um, so that's about when you... I can't remember later the exact years. Yeah. But it was like... Uh, no, it was later than 2009. Ah, okay. Then, okay. <clears throat> because I did my PhD in... Uh, I started in 2016. Oh. In PhD. And you're at UCLA doing your PhD. Yes, but that, oh, okay. that was after, right? So, so, so that's where, like, that's where I started to get interested at to apply to UCLA. So, uh, so I started studying uh, Pearl's textbook, uh, and then another. This is in another, the PhD uh, program in stats. At do you go to UCLA hoping to study near Pearl, or is it just like UCLA is a great program? No, so uh, so during my masters, I, I I got in touch with Pearl's writings, right? Yeah. And that got me very curious, and, and and I said like, man, this is this helps clarifying a lot of things about what what these things means. So so that was very helpful. Yeah. And another author that uh, had a, a huge impact on me was Edward Lemer. Uh, Ed Lemer. Uh, so so I was yeah Ed Lemer. Yeah. So I was reading a, a lot of, of of his stuff. True. Uh, and then both are at UCLA. Both are at UCLA, right. 
Yeah, and then that's where I say, oh, maybe I could apply to, to UCLA. And then yeah. I got to meet them. Uh, and it turns out that I uh, that, that happened. So that was pretty cool, actually. Yeah, that was cool. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you get yeah. to UCLA, so, you get into the stats program. What is it that when you first get to the program, causal inference is just like one of the many interests that you have? Or is it something that you're becoming more like, focused in because you know i mean with with the rubin causal model being statistics you could have easily just sorted into causal inference from day one but not the kind of guy you are now so what exact what's what's in your head at the beginning no so when i got it at ucla when i when i was at, at that that stage then i already had pretty clear that my interest is in causal inference and causal inference methodology and and Methodology for empirical sciences in general, social social health sciences, uh, and uh, that I wanted to follow the structural approach. Let's say, mm. which I don't want to sound dogmatic. The potential outcomes are like uh, is encompassed on this, right? So yeah. Uh, so I was a, a little already a little sold out on the. On What's the it mean for a statistician then, when a statistician says I was more interested in the structural approach? not the potential <laughs> outcomes approach because in in economic structural econometrics is a whole kind of area what does it mean to you when you say that kind of thing just for the sake of the listener well so first they're they are the same in the, in the following sense right like uh so the structure approach would be just one way to think of how the potential outcomes are generated so so instead of uh, instead of starting with the potential outcomes as primitives you think as the world as of a collection of mechanisms and, mm -hmm. and, and response functions, which are the potential outcomes. Actually. Yep. And and then and the potential outcomes are defined as as uh, inter uh, like uh, interventions on this this structural systems. Right. So uh, now I guess in economics there is a lot of debate because when people talk about structural models, they are usually thinking I'm going to have this heavily stylized. Uh, structural industrial model or, or whatever, yeah. and then and and, and 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 then when people talk about potential outcomes, they're going to think more about I'm going to define things more non parametrically, mm -hmm. and then I would define a potential outcome, and then I define an estimate and, and, and use those uh, semi or non parametric identification strategies. <clears throat> uh, but I like to view both as two sides of the same coin. Right. Well, so uh, in stats, so, so you, with that Rubin tradition, you know, I would think that it would have been like a black hole, just kind of like pulling you into that Rubin tradition, but you're going towards Pearl. So is that like, what did your professors think? And what did your colleagues think, your classmates? Well, the, the UCLA department is very interdisciplinary uh, mm. and very open-minded. So I don't think it was a problem. Yeah. at all like uh yeah so so in that sense i think it was a uh, i had a lot of freedom i never thought people were trying to push me one direction or another uh, mm. uh, so so the, the experience was great and i don't think it was a problem yeah yeah so so do you start working closely with lemur and with pearl or is it or you sort of have a different group of pe group of professors that you're interacting with the mo mainly well so Limer was a great mentor uh so so I, I actually got to meet him before the the phd and then uh throughout the phd i would meet with him like uh well i don't know maybe every two weeks every month uh we didn't write a paper together so that's something that uh, i wanted to fix Mm. Uh, but he influenced me a lot uh, in basically almost everything I've I, I have written. I always I'm, I'm always ah. in the back of my mind thinking, okay, like uh, what is the one, what is that going to think about this? Uh, <laughs> and, and he's a, and he's a very critical guy, so 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 he's hard to please. Uh, so when, whenever you can please him, you can see oh, yeah, I'm doing a good job. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so I didn't get to write with him, but uh, but he was in my committee, and 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 he was uh, uh, like I I used to talk to 
with him uh, uh, constantly. And Pro, I, I only met him after I was there. And then... You only met him what? What would you say, Carlos? You only met him what? After I Hold on, you asked you. What'd you say? No, so I said I, I, I only met uh, Pro after I joined the program. Oh. Uh, a little later after joining the program. And then and then we started developing a, a relationship. And then, then he later uh, became one of my advisors. Uh, yeah. Along with Chad Hazlitt. Uh, okay. Okay. Which is from uh, joint political science and, and stats. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Is, is so so um so you were you um how how do I characterize you know the kind of work you're doing you know if the only thing I know in Pearl's world are these graphical models are you sort of you know how are you is it pretty much I mean I I wouldn't have thought Ed Lemer and Pearl would be kind of in each other's orbit like that, but is it pretty, it's pretty much seamless that you're able to kind of, kind of work within that, those two guys influences. I'm sure that what, how to explain it. <laughs> well, like, uh, uh, because, well, it depends on the work. So I have, uh, so for example, I do, uh, a lot of the work that I do is on sensitivity analysis. Uh, uh, insensitive analysis uh, to an observed confounding or to critical right. assumptions that we make yep. when we're making causal inferences. Uh, so, for example, if we're using instrumental variables, uh, sensitivity to the exclusion restriction, uh, and we have other, other things coming on. Um, so, in that theme, uh, so, so uh, sensitive analysis, even though not exactly on this part, uh, is something that uh, Ed uh, was. Uh, wrote a, a lot of things and it influenced me a lot. Uh, and with Pro, uh, you it's also, it's part of causal inference, right? So uh, so I have sensitive analysis, which would be uh, some part of it is more on the, let's say economics, econometric side, which I take the estimate as given. And then I say, let's suppose you just wanted to adjust for this variable and uh, uh, what would be the bias if you didn't have this variable and so on. Yeah. Uh, so the graph can play a role, but the, the, the role is, is is more auxiliary. But on the other hand, we also have uh, uh, work on sensitive analysis where we start from the graph and say, well, let's suppose we didn't have this edge. Now we put this edge. Mm. Let's parameterize the strength of this edge and oh. see what happens. Uh, That's how you're happens. kind uh, of thinking in your mind about the sensitivity <laughs> analysis is like, Imagine a confounder here, edge here, or something like that. Well, I think in both approaches, right? So you can have a, a more like, so you can have a, a, a DAG first approach where you draw a DAG and you and you and, and you uh, include an edge or delete an edge or you yeah. violate the DAG, right? Right. And then you see what are the consequences of this violation. Yeah. But the other approach would be more: I start with an actual target estimate, so for example, I, I want to start with an a, a instrumental variable estimate. I, I, I know I want to do IV, and you can have several different DAGs that justify this IV approach. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you say, well, I, I want to do IV, but I, I wish I had this variable. Uh, had I had I control for this variable, I would have a valid IV, but I didn't. So now I can ask, uh, what is the difference between the target IV estimate that I wish I had estimated and the, well, in, in economist language, the long IV estimate, what is the difference between the long IV estimate and the short IV estimate, for example, um, mm -hmm. or the long regression, the short regression. Right. So, so this is a more like a, uh, estimate based view where I, I'm, I'm starting from the premise that the researcher already decided uh, what is the, the, the functional that they want to estimate, and then we're just contrasting this functional with or without like some unobserved variable that would have made that functional a valid mm. cause effect estimate. Mm. So, so I like to work with both approaches because uh, each has like its pros and cons. I think, right? Like, mm. uh, uh, and, 
and and they are not mutually exclusive, of course, right? Like uh, you still should, I think, should draw the diagram in the other approach to just to try to understand why this violation of unconfoundedness or exclusion restriction would be happening and so on. Oh, yeah, yeah. If that makes any sense. Does that yeah, sense? yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, so you leave UCLA when? When do you graduate? Around that time I saw you, right? Like 2018? No, it was a little later than that. So it was in Why did I see? Why did we run into each other? You were you weren't still a student? When was that? Yeah, I was still a student and I was working closely with Pearl. Uh, oh, okay. And yeah, and then we was the three of us, I guess, right? Like we had uh, Yeah, we had that dinner. Uh dinner, yeah, yeah. It was fun. That was fun. Uh Okay, yeah, so you, it was great. Like I had very good times there. Um, yeah. So you graduate. Yeah. So I graduated in 2021. Uh, so I was in the job market during the pandemic. Oh. Uh, so that was a very unusual job market. Um, like everything was online. Mm. No one was understanding what's going on. Um, but it turns out everything turns out turned out okay. And then I joined. University of Washington in September 2021. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so I want to I want to talk a little bit about a couple of papers uh, that that I think are real accessible even over a podcast. Probably the first one I want to talk about this paper with Pearl, uh, where it's about you know taking it's one way of thinking about it is it's like you know uh, which of the covariates you need and which of the covariates you don't need. Uh, good and bad controls. Can you sort of just tell me a little bit for like the the listeners? You know, what is the what's the big idea of that paper? Yeah, so the, so this paper is called the crash course in good and bad controls, um, and, and uh, this paper started actually as a blog post. <laughs> oh, so uh, so we started because like uh, uh, so so this this language that we're using is. Is, is actually the economist's language, right? So, so bad controls were popularized, I guess, by Angus and Pishk, uh, mostly harmless. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then uh, the idea there was like, I say, hey, like people are talking all the time about this, this idea of bad controls and so on, but I'm not sure how many of them know that you can actually use graphs to, to help you uh, think through. Yeah. Uh, so, so kind of let's make a, Let's think about the simplest models possible, like yeah. that would illustrate the the concept, right? Like yeah. so. So let's say, uh, so we have the idea of a collider, the idea of a mediator, the idea of of uh, well, the actual confounder or a proxy of a confounder, and so on. And so, what would be the simplest models possible that we could use mm -hmm. to teach the concept and say, uh, right, like uh, would this would this be a good control? Would this be a bad bad control? Uh, so, so we wrote a blog post uh, in Yuda's uh, blog, actually, uh, and then people wanted to start citing it uh, <clears throat> and say, "Hey, like, do you have something that we could cite?" So, so then we we discussed and said, "Well, maybe we should make this into at least a, a, a technical report and have a PDF." So we beefed up a little bit uh, the 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 post, and then. Uh, including citations and references and other examples. And in this process, I said, well, well, like, since we're doing this, let's just make it a paper. Uh, <clears throat> and that's how the, how the paper came about. Um, and to be honest, I, I, I had no idea it would be, uh, it would have this impact uh, that, that it's having. Mm. Uh, because our goal is very modest. It's just like, let's go example by example, just like you would do in a, uh, like imagine your first learning calculus. Yeah. I could I could teach you the definition of a derivative or the definition of an integral and how you compute it, but if you don't actually go through examples and solve, and and, and with simple examples first, you don't really internalize it, right? So the idea was, yeah, let's have these all these models and you can solve it, and then you you're gonna come up with questions. So so when students are first learning, they 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 yeah they come up with questions and say, oh, why is this like this in this case? Is this not like not like that in that case. Uh, uh, so it's having a lot of then, impact. You've noticed the site. What's the site? The sites sites are you're watching the sites go up a lot. 
Yeah, now it's my second most cited paper. Oh yeah. Uh, so, so apparently there was a some demand for this paper, and and I totally. think the and, and the reason and I think the reason was there was like uh, we had a lot of beginners uh, tutorials mm. that uh, there was a very let's say. Like you should be more verbose and explaining a lot and and and, and with a lot of details and we will, we had advanced materials, but we didn't have this intermediate step where you need to synthesize knowledge. Like yeah, okay, I learned a little bit of DEX already, and I know about the backdoor criterion. I know about these other things, but like uh, now, how do I make sense of all this? And you just go and and I guess that's the demand that it's supplying. It's just distilling these main lessons that graphical models have to offer. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, well, if you want to have a better precision, you should adjust for variables closer to the outcome. If you're, if you're going to increase your variance, avoid variables, like if variables closer to the treatment are going to increase your variance. If you want a total effect, don't adjust for mediators, like uh, uh, watch out for colliders. So these kind of things, like uh, in a very visual, visual way, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I, I don't know. Like we never know actually. So, so yeah. What's yeah. surprising? But, I well, you know the the <clears throat> the approach we learned in grad school. You know, was you do not use. They called it the kitchen sink regression, where you just you know put every variable in the data set in the on the right hand side, and you were told not to do that, and that didn't solve omitted variable bias. But it seems like with the rise of machine learning. And causal inference, you're getting more of that. You know, you get more of just this like, here's a gigantic number of features, and machine learning is just gonna, you know, uh, you the more variables you have, the more it can sort of find every confounder and or at least soak it up enough such that unconfoundedness can hold. What's your reaction when you see something like that? Well, uh, so I think uh, machine learning is very helpful uh, in the sense that now how we are able to handle high dimensional confounders in a more principled way, right? Uh, <clears throat> but on the other hand, it doesn't solve the fundamental issues, right? So if you have a bad control there, yeah, machine learning can't solve that. So machine learning can the only thing it can do is like given a, an appropriate set of control variables. It's gonna adjust it the best way it can uh, with the limited limited data we have, and uh, and without the need to saying, oh, should I put a quadratic term here? Or should not? Should I not put a quadratic term? And so on. So it just the adjustment. It does the adjustment in a more uh, data driven, agnostic way. Yeah. Uh, but in, in the part where okay, uh, is this the set of variables that I, if I could, I, I should have adjusted for? Then machine learning can't answer that, right? So that, that's where we still need economic theory uh, and, and causal inference to guide us and say, well, this is this is actually a post-treatment variable. It could be a mediator. So if I if I throw this in there, uh, it's going to completely uh, ruin my estimate, for example. Or it seems or like the like area that. of unconfoundedness <clears throat> is the area of this potential outcome approach, where the potential outcome approach is really a theoretical seems like it's in the area of unconfoundedness where it seems like uh, extremely uh, implausible or like, you know, like not, not very, you know, the, 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 to take an, to take a completely blind approach to covariates uh, and, you know, without any kind of structure that's involved in like what even you should be conditioning on, seems like it's in the area of these, co you know, picking covariate good and bad controls that it's, that it's really bad. Cause it seems like unconfoundedness just kind of assumes that you have the good controls. Doesn't provide any, you know, it doesn't provide any way to know. And in fact, like I, I oftentimes just don't even know when I read some of those writers, well, they just kind of skip over it. They just kind of assume unconfoundedness. And then, you know, all the students are like, well, how do you know which covariates to control for? And you have, all you can say is you got to control for the covariates that satisfy unconfoundedness, which is not very satisfying to, uh, to yes. somebody that's like, doesn't know what that means. 
Yes, that, that was sort of like uh, the appeal of, of graphical models for me. It was like, <clears throat> because like, uh, so I think like when you start learning potential outcomes, uh, this, is, this is very good in the sense that it helps you define your target of inference yeah. precisely. Uh, it, it allows you to differentiate between associational quantities, uh, counterfactuals, uh, even though uh, uh, <clears throat> sometimes it doesn't make this distinction, which I think is useful, but something doesn't think between interventional quantities and pure counterfactual quantities, right? Mm. When, because when we introduce the dual, we can make this distinction. Uh, but like it helps you a lot on that. And then it helps you all, uh, to articulate, for example, an assumption like confoundness. Um, right, right. But then, but then it's lacking on that thing. Okay, but how do I know in an econometric model or like in an economics model? Uh, whether unconfoundedness hold, right? Yeah. So suppose I have a theory of like of this causes this, this causes that, and that causes that. Would I know, like if even if I knew perfectly what causes what, would I know how to pick the correct variables? Right. And then when, it, when I realized that I, I, I wouldn't know, <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, or, or even if I did know, I, would, I need to think very hard about it. Uh, in a like an ad hoc way, and then it's uh, yeah, like this is this is not very helpful. And then when you learn graphical models, then you see, whoa, it's actually very simple. Like uh, 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 once you're really to to write down the model, and then I, I guess a lot of people think, oh, well, how do you know if the data is correct? I say, no, let's withhold this judgment for a while. Let's yeah. because like even if you knew the DAG, you wouldn't know how to pick the variable. So so that's a problem, right? Like. Uh, so like, let, let's start from the premise that, well, let's assume that you actually knew what causes what, would you know what to, to condition on? Uh, and I think uh, graphical models helps a lot on, on make this reasoning very clear. Yeah. And and maybe I'm biased, but I think once you learn it, you can just see a, see a, a DAG and, and decide immediately. Like it's actually, right. actually visually very intuitive. You start getting like a very fluent yep. uh, on this reasoning. Uh, yeah. Uh, and and so I think that's one of, of the of the of the main strengths of learning graphical models is to to dis demystify a little bit what an assumption like unconfoundedness means. Uh, right, right. Uh, uh, and and also how fragile it can be, right? Because once yeah. you write down a, a a graphical model that justifies unconfoundedness, mm -hmm. the first thing that comes to mind is ah. Oh, but what about this arrow here you, that you you didn't draw? What about yeah. this confounder here? And and some people think that's a, it's a bug, but I think that's a feature, right? Like yeah, because yeah. It, like if you just write down the unconfounder's assumption, it's a little abstract, and then mm -hmm. came coming up with alternative stories that mm -hmm. would violate this assumption is not as straightforward as when you actually commit to a model and then someone can easily criticize your model, right? And say, oh, uh, you forgot this confounder here, you forgot this, this error here. Yeah. So uh, you have this uh, other paper that, <clears throat> you know, now I'm realizing this, this, uh, this influence of Lemur on this like sensitivity analysis. You have this other paper about, you know, where the practice of some economists is just to kind of like, you know, put in more covariates and then look at the coefficient stability. And, and you sort of, you, you know, there's a literature on this and the, and uh, in, in econometrics with, you know, Tabor, I think, and uh, Emily Oster and others, and you sort of enter into it too, but it's, it's got more of this flavor of lemur a little bit. Is that right? This kind of, if I added, you know, if I, if, if how sensitive is this to one more one more problem, or even this thing you were saying with the DAGs, which is if I put in you know one more arrow, is that right? Is that the the way I need to enter into this paper? Uh, well, oh, sort of. So so this paper is uh, uh, well, we touch on this too, but that's one part of the paper. So so the paper is basically so imagine the traditional omitted variable bias formula you learn in any econometrics textbook, right? Yeah. So you wish you had adjusted for an omitted variable, but you didn't. Uh, how how would that have biased uh, a regression coefficient? And for now, let's assume that the long regression coefficient, using the economist language, the long regression coefficient is the target parameter of interest, which we know it may not be because uh, assuming linearity may be too strong, so that may be a weighted average of of like a, a various weighted average of of 
it is and so on. But let's assume that like you wish you had uh, adjusted for some variable in that long regression coefficient it stands for whatever you, it is that you want to estimate. But you don't have that variable. Then you just estimate the short regression with the short regression coefficient. And then what you learn uh, in, in a traditional econometrics textbook is that uh, omitted variable bias format that expresses the bias as a product of two regression coefficients, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the pro it's a coefficient of the uh, omitted variable in the long regression plus the coefficient uh, of the, let's say, treatment variable uh, when you regress it uh, <clears throat> on, on the confounder. Mm. Uh, and then uh, that's like a useful tool. Like it's, it's something that every economist I think should know. Uh, to, so you can think about reason about, okay, what if I had this omitted variable, how much it could affect it? But it has some limitations because uh, uh, you actually need to, to think in terms of regression coefficients. And you may have like several omitted variables or omitted variables in a unit that you, you cannot express as a product of regression coefficients and so on. Yeah. So what we do in that paper is uh, basically to, to show that you can actually re-express this omitted variable bias formula in terms of uh, partial R squares. And, and, and then basically... Oh, so you're starting uh, with this paper. This paper is what? This paper is... Who, who is wanting to use this paper? Well, what kind of project are they working on where they think... <laughs> yeah, this is the paper. We need to read this paper by Carlos because we're working on this kind of paper and it's, this is going to be really helpful. What What is it? What's the problem it's solving? So if so, if it's a paper that you're running a regression and you think you 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 don't have like a confounders does not hold, that's yeah. a paper. That's a paper you should use. Right. And then then you can try to quantify how bad things need to be to change the conclusions of the paper. Mm hmm. So, so what we show in the paper is that, like, uh, uh, it's it's not it's actually all you need to know to bound the bias is the maximum explanatory power of the omitted variable. So you just need to think, okay, let's suppose you ran a regression, uh, uh, and then like I don't know regression of a treatment on some outcome, let's say income, uh, and then the total R square of your outcome regression, and people are gonna say, oh, R squares are bad, no, not necessarily. <laughs> And then your R squared there in the regression was like 20% or something. Mm -hmm. And then you say, oh, okay, but I had this other uh, variable, which is parental income that I wish I had measured, but I didn't. Yeah. Then all you need to think about is, okay, how much more would you bump that R square of the outcome regression? And how much more you would bump the R square of the treatment regression? If you tell me those two things, we can bound the bias. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. And, and, it doesn't matter how, like, it could be any arbitrary number of confounders, not, not just one confounder, like uh, multiple confounders and so on. Uh, if you just tell me what is the maximum exponential power of this, this, these variables, we, this, this is sufficient to bound the bias. Mm. So, so it simplifies judgment a lot uh, about mm. the plausibility of, of these latent variables. And the other thing that we can do, and that relates to Oster and Tabor and, and so on, is... Right, maybe I don't know exactly, like in terms of absolute strength of this confounder, uh, but I know what the important variables are. So, for example, what are the uh, main determinants of the treatment assignment? And then, if you know that, and then you think that the omitted variable is not as strong as as this observed variable that you measured, yeah, then we can bound the bias if the confounder were as strong as, for example, this key variable that you measured. Say you measured. Uh, like you didn't have uh, parental income, but you had a proxy for parental income, and you think, well, this this proxy perhaps is good enough. Uh, parental income would not be that like, it would not add as much explanatory power as this thing as this proxy itself. Mm -hmm. If you can make relative judgment, relative judgments might like that comparing observed variables with the unobserved variables. This is also sufficient to. To bound the bias. So these are mm. the two things that we do on, on that paper. Um, and in that paper, we just do for linear regression. So that's like the bread and butter, I guess, uh, of traditional uh, economics. Could I could I use uh, it with linear? Have... Could I use it with linear regression, and then move into something else? You know, like yeah. So now we have uh, we have a new like we have a new paper now that does the 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 same. Uh, 
the same the same thing right in terms of bounding the bias but for no parametric regression mm. so uh so if you're using the bias machine learning or other non-parametric met methods to estimate an average treatment effect for example yeah uh we can do this same type of exercise uh of, of bounding the, the omitted variable bias mm. uh Without uh, without the need to assume linearity or that the target parameter is a regression coefficient. But what's Pearl think about this paper? Usually, the way I see well, it, <laughs> these DAG guys, they're like, "Well, the DAGs make these testable predictions, and then we can test for all these independence assumptions." But you're kind of going at it a different way. Yeah. So, so this is the when, when, like this is kind of like the way I was, I was telling you in the beginning, in the sense that. Here we're starting with a target estimate, yeah, uh, and then they're saying, "Well, we, I, I already assumed that, for example, you want to estimate an average treatment effect, and the estimate is this guy, but right. you just didn't have this omitted variable." Yeah, but this, this is not like a, a, but this is this is one way to frame frame the problem, so we can work with this specific problem. Mm -hmm. But this is not like a, a, this is complementary to to DAGs too, because the idea would be in the, in the following sense, like. Uh, you could you like in an actual application, you would you would think about a DAG, you would think about the omitted variable, you think about possibility of which variables to adjust for or not, and and you can use the DAG to illustrate also uh, what the potential violations of of unconfounders could be. Yeah. Uh, and then once you have that, uh, the the actual formula for the bias is going to be the same, right? So. So we have something that works for any situation where uh, once your target estimate is that specific estimate, which I'm adjusting for confounders, including this omitted variable u, mm -hmm. uh, then then um, uh, this bias formula holds, right? So so I think it's just two two different ways of seeing the problem. I can start with a target estimate and then uh, work out what the bias would be uh, comparing the long and the short estimate. Or another more open-ended approach, I start with a DAG and then I, I put a violation, but then the, the actual target estimate could be something different, right? Uh, which is something that I also work on as well. Yeah. Uh, but that's something that, for example, economists are not very used to, right? So, so for example, uh, uh, in, in economics, people are, are, there will be like four or five main approaches to identification that they're comfortable with, right? Yeah, and, and 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 of course, DAGs are fully compatible with that in the sense that they can be used to to justify or try to to mm -hmm. illustrate why you think that those assumptions hold. Uh, but they would work with I don't know uh, unconfoundedness assumption, instrumental variables, difference in differences, uh, regression discontinuity designs, and and like these types of identification assumptions. Uh, whereas if we we open up to to the whole deck world, there are many, many other estimates you could use, right? You have the front door formula, you have the napkin. Uh, we don't even have a good name for it, but it's the napkin formula. So there are other identification strategies that are not as popular yet, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, but, but that you could do sensitivity for those guys to, uh, or for any arbitrary uh, estimate given a, a graphical model. Uh, this is really cool. This yeah. is really cool. I mean, have you noticed economists <laughs> paying attention to some of your your work? Is it is it getting? I mean, this connection to causal inference immediately gets them into the worldview of the economists. But are you are you noticing some interactions with econometricians that that have surprised you? Or is it still yeah, pretty I, I think siloed so. out? No, I, I think so. Uh, uh, so uh, I, we have been having an academic conversation uh, with other econometricians. Mm -hmm. uh, they are citing uh, this work uh, and, and also uh, uh, expanding on this work. The, the, the recent paper that I, that I told you about with the omitted variable bias for the bias machine learning, that's yeah. with, uh, with economists too. Uh, mm. So, uh, so for example, there's a Victor Chernozukov and, and Whitney Nui uh, on the paper. That's with uh, you? Vasilis. Yeah. You're, you're on that paper with paper. Victor and Whitney? Okay. Yeah. So so the paper is called Long Story Short, uh, Omitted Variable Bias in Causal Machine Learning. Mm. Mm. Uh, 
And that, uh, well, of course, I'm a little biased. I think that paper is pretty cool because uh, we're uh, basically solving the problem of emitted verbal bias for a large class of, of, uh, of, of target estimates, right? Mm. Uh, uh, so technically it would be for, for any target parameter that can be expressed as a linear function of the condition expectation function. Hmm. But like in practice, that would be, for example, average treatment effects, average treatment effect on the treated, uh, group average treatment effects. So, so uh, things that are very common, uh, let's say, for causal inference. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, I wish I wish more economists were paying attention to. Uh, let's. Well, hopefully, after this conversation, uh, some of them are going to get curious. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, they can feel feel free to reach out. I, yeah. I, I try to be very uh, responsive on emails and, and yeah. everything. Well, so this is the top of the hour, but. Um... Mm -hmm. So you've 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 got this new career merging, you know, and you could have gone into uh, economics. And so I'm just kind of curious. Somewhere out there is some kid, and you know they're like you were in college. Mm -hmm. They liked certain things in economics, didn't like other things, uh, and you know they might not be thinking that the things that they liked in economics might be there in stats. And I was just kind of curious, you know, what do you think is the way that you would try to explain to some kid in economics that actually does like a lot of the same things you liked? How would you go about sort of telling them, you know, there it's, it's not just economics that you've found where you could do this. There's other things. What, what would you, what do you think is the attractive pitch? Uh, well, so for example, if, if the main things that you're liking about economics is the causal inference part, for example, mm -hmm. and econometrics, uh, so that's an area that uh, permeates like uh, many other sciences. Um, and, and you can find, like you can work on this on other fields as well, right? Like, so uh, statistics, one of them. Uh, and, and, and so this data science part of economics is something that you can explore in other fields and, and perhaps with the benefit of not just, just worrying about economic applications, right? Um, there are other parts of economics, though, that uh, it's kind of harder, I guess, to, to find uh, uh, applications in other fields, but it's still possible. Like, uh, and for example, some of the micro theory that I actually enjoyed, I never done it before, after my, my PhD. Because mm -hmm. I think if you want to really do that, you do need to 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 be in an economics department. Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, I guess like causal inference, uh, uh, econometrics, uh, and, and like data science aspects in general, I think these are things that uh, <clears throat> you can you can switch to other type to other programs such as statistics and still keep your like connections with economic economists mm -hmm. in economics right yeah yeah yeah, <clears throat> yeah. cool cool well it's, it's been, been so it's nice to to talk to you and to hear more about these papers uh i think as you were talking i was thinking i wouldn't mind uh working through some of these new papers on my sub stack and just trying to teach them to myself uh so i might try to do that in a coming up but it was really nice talking to you, Carlos, and good to see you again. Yeah, it was great uh, chatting, Scott, and, and uh, thank you so much again for, for inviting me. Okay, cool. All right, happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye -bye.